Okay, this story I title Resident. And this is something I've kind of been intrigued with for, for a while. Uh, bookstores, uh, when they started to dry up, it was very tough on writers, established writers who'd made their living writing. One way or another, they'd, they'd cranked out a living, sometimes taking you know, little small jobs or ghostwriting or sometimes having to teach at colleges, teach writing courses to supplement their income, maybe do some magazine work sometimes to supplement their novels. But one way or another, they, they've been able to be full-time writers. They had been able to, to be full-time writers. That whole thing drag, dried up for a lot of people when bookstores started to close. And that's understandable because they were producing less books. And then when they were producing less books, the self-publishing industry took off. And at first that was looked down upon. And then it became, uh, you know, a hotbed of, uh, uh, you know, of making, of actually making a good living for authors who were clever, who kind of shifted gears, not always the best authors anymore, but the best marketers. And I think that's still, that's still the way it is today. I, <laughs> I like to think I'm a pretty good author, but I'm not one of the best money makers because I'm not a good uh, marketer. I don't market. I hardly market at all, but forget all that stuff. Uh, I took a character who sort of had another book in him. He'd been a lifelong writer, had another book in him, and it bothered him that he he didn't, his, his last book he wrote beneath his abilities, and that might have been 20 years ago in New York, and, um, and they tried another one and couldn't get a contract for it, and his agent told him it's not the book anymore, it's just the computer now. The computer spits out these numbers to publishers, and... Uh, you know, you're not a, you're not a good name anymore. And, and so you're not going to, you're not going to rank They don't bookstores. If they were around, wouldn't want you on the main shelves up near the register. Uh, you know, it just, it's just a fact. It's a business now. Um, <clears throat> and Donald Westlake began to address that in a great book called the hook about a couple of writers where one guy starts having trouble. And what he does is he, he takes on a pen name his numbers were bad in the computer, and he, he, he kind of dropped off the off the radar. So he, he starts with a pen name, New Identity, and he fakes it that he's a an American expat living in Italy, kind of a mysterious new writer on the scene, and he's writing. And so he, he writes, and so for a little while, three or four books, those did okay again. He got contracts. They did okay. But then they started to drop off, and then he thought, geez, do I, you know, what do I, another identity now? What am I going to do? So sort of an interesting dilemma. And this guy's kind of going through that. He's doing some soul searching. Should I try to run another book, and should I concede the fact that I'm going to have to put it on Amazon, where I always look down on self-publishers, but that's, you know, the place now. That's where I could get it out there. Is it worth it to go to all the trouble and write my final conclusive book and and put it on Amazon and, and kind of get it straight. And he's, he's going through that. And in the middle of that, he, he's, he's living at a residence inn in Manhattan beach, uh, long-term in the middle of that. There's, uh, there's some evidence of foul play at uh, one night at the, at the motel. So that kind of crosses paths. The guy, interestingly, I sort of admire the guy in a way he, He's living in the residence inn, which is even even though it's um, not really fancy, you're still in Manhattan Beach, California. You're on Sepulveda Boulevard. You're not down by the beach. You're about a mile from the beach, but it's expensive just because of where you are. And um, they have a long term rate, but that was still way too expensive. So he walks into the office one day, uh, kind of like with a briefcase full of money. <laughs> And he kind of makes them an offer they can't refuse. He gets the manager. He says, I'll give you 40000 bucks right now up front. Uh, and, but for five years. And they, and it sort of makes, you know, makes a deal and it makes it work. And so it comes out to seven or 800 bucks a month, which is a, a sweet deal for living down there. Uh, he has had to put up all the money up front, and so that's it. If he moves or something, he's stuck. But um, and, it, and it also includes breakfast, which is a very nice breakfast, a full full breakfast. And uh, and, and even little dinners a couple nights a week. 
out by the pool. They barbecue some stuff. So he's happy. Um, and I sort of admire that. You just, uh, it's almost like you're buying into a condominium or something, but you know, he's, he's worked out a way where he can actually live in Manhattan beach, um, and afford it and have a nice little lifestyle. And he walks down to the beach every day and he's got his routine, but with it all, he's wondering, should he, you know, should he go back to writing or just, you know, pack that all in. And then this, uh, this little foul play, uh, incident kind of jump starts him maybe to think of it in a different, uh, different direction. So that's the story resonant. Resident. They were in Irving's Deli on Wilshire Boulevard in Santa Monica. Finch and his retired agent, Stu Portnoy. The other side of it, Finch said, is does the world need another book from me? One thing I still like about this place is they put the pickles automatically on the table, Portnoy said. Right away you're eating. Come on, you hearing me at all? I am, but I get it already. Stop with the wanting approval. You sound like someone on Facebook. I'm just saying, Finch said, before I plunge in, all that work. What work? What else you got going that's in the way? I have my routine. I get up, hoof it over to Starbucks. That's a mile, give or take. Read the sports page. Eavesdrop on people's conversations. When the fog is efficiently burned off, I go down to the Strand, take in whatever bikini situation you might have. Even on weekdays, Portnoy said, bikinis walking around? Not as many, Finch said. I hear you, though. No guarantee anyone will read it. You're lumped in on Amazon now with the dips who get their romance novels ghostwritten in the Philippines for 50 bucks a shot. Which is part of what holds me back, Finch said. Anyhow, then about four I start walking home. I'm picturing it, Portnoy said. Plenty of hills, that's good. Helps me sleep, Finch said. What he didn't mention to Portnoy were the memory lapses. Small shit, here and there, not the scary stuff like getting mixed up on what month it was or whether he'd eaten lunch or not. But not being able to come up with Paul Newman's name when he was flipping around the other night and Butch Cassidy came on. Not always remembering his phone number or email address when he was trying to give it to someone. Which wasn't that often, but still. He'd been a legitimate writer once, and for a good stretch made a living at it in New York. Though it helped to teach undergraduate courses when he could pick them up at NYU or even over in Jersey at Rutgers. There had been magazine work as well, a refreshing diversion from the grind of fiction, and he tried to pitch stories that grabbed him, such as the identical twins from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, who were born three months premature and ended up on the U.S. bobsled team. That one was in 1994, his final article for Sports Illustrated, which is when things started to dry up big time. His first novel, Monty's Question Mark, was published in 87 by Simon & Schuster. The sequel, Monty on Vacation, in 89. And four years later, he squeezed out what he assumed was the concluder, Weekends with Monty. Back then, there were book release events within the business, usually at trendy restaurants in Soho and Tribeca and Finch would get up halfway through and thank a bunch of people. The first book was well received by the critics, specifically David Piermont in The Times, who called it a spare revealing snapshot of the contemporary urban struggle. And the second got mostly favorable reviews. The third book was hammered by the critics, and two years later Finch couldn't get a contract for the Angus Compendium which was his favorite of the four, but nothing to do with the Monty series, and which admittedly went off the deep end in a few places. Portnoy explained to him back then that it wasn't necessarily a bad book, 
but that publishers were abandoning instinct and going more and more by computer projections and not to take it personally. Finch said fine, but he didn't buy the fancy reasoning. Weekends with Monty had been a clunker and deserved to get ripped. He wrote beneath his abilities in that book, and it still ate at him. What he liked to do, and what was more urgent now that these small but real memory lapses were occurring, was put out the fourth and final Monty book, finishing off the series properly and leaving his mark for anyone who might care. It was too much to think about tonight, though. It had been fun shooting the breeze with Portnoy for old time's sake. But now a few easy laps in the pool sounded very good, followed by a long soak in the hot tub. Things could be worse when you put it in perspective. Finch lived in the Marriott Residence Inn on Sepulveda Boulevard. The standard long-term rate was too steep, so he made a deal with them. Five years up front, 40 grand, the option to renew. This kept it under $700 a month, a sweet deal for Manhattan Beach, and it included breakfast. The room wasn't all that spacious. His door opened onto the parking lot, and off to the right you saw the back of an auto glass shop. But how much did you really need? A couple weeks after his lunch with Portnoy, he returned from his daily routine, and there were three squad cars at the hotel, one by the office, and two about six doors down from his room, along with, he saw now, an unmarked car as well. He went over there and one of the cops said, You familiar with these people at all? 32B, Spankman? Not sure, Finch said. If I see them, then I'll know. You won't be. We took them in, the cop said. The boyfriend. The female's an L.A. general. Guy stabbed her and called 911 is what we got. Finch did remember there was a couple arguing quietly but pretty intensely last night in the lounge area off the pool where the hotel served these complimentary half happy hour mini dinners three nights a week, which weren't bad at all. The guy real neat, gold chains, a mustache, looked like he had a hair weave. She was a lot younger, very white skin, somewhat voluptuous in an outfit that was slightly too tight. It was an interesting altercation, what he could hear of it, something you might use in a novel. And Finch sat close to them, pretending to be absorbed in the hotel tourist brochure on Universal Studios. It sounded like the woman may have been a paid mistress, but who didn't like it that the man was seeing multiple women. Or maybe it was one woman in particular who got under her skin, but either way she was angry. Were they on vacation, he asked the cop, or just passing through, or what? Let's let me ask the questions, okay, the cop said. Would be helpful if you noticed something or heard anything coming out of the room. Here. He fiddled around with an iPad and showed Finch a photo, looking like it was part of a Facebook page, and it was the man from the argument. Finch said there was nothing that jumped out, and the cop gave him his card, just in case. He went back to his room and turned on the news. That was one of the simple pleasures of hotels, lying on the bed flipping channels. There wasn't anything about a stabbing at the residence inn, so he did his little swim and hot tub thing, showered and went next door to Target, where he seldom bought anything but liked to look around. The late news did have a mention of it, no names or details, just that the man had been taken into custody in an apparent domestic dispute with a woman who was in serious but stable condition. A day went by, quiet, and then the next morning you had a forensics van and two unmarked cars outside room 32B. There was a young gal with a reporter's notebook talking to a detective-like guy in a suit. When she was done, she saw Finch standing there and said, Would you have a moment? Finch said he had all day. The woman laughed and extended her hand. I'm Holly, she said. I'm with the Daily Breeze. Finch knew the paper. It was the local weekly that covered Manhattan, Hermosa, and Redondo. Never much in there. Forensics now and everything, Finch said. She died, Holly said, overnight. Apparently there was a blood clot and she took a turn. 
Jesus, Finch said, picturing the woman again, not wanting to, but wondering where he stabbed her and with what. So I'm looking to fill in the blanks, Ollie said. May I ask how many nights you've been here? Finch had to think about that one. Around 700, give or take, he said. Now you're pulling my leg. I might have something for you, he said. Of course, that'd require buying you dinner. There's a Mexican joint. Scions. I've been there, Holly said. Well, you don't appear dangerous, and frankly, I'm pretty sure you're too old to be trying something. So, okay. Tonight, Finch said. The sooner the better, she said. The place felt like it was once an old-fashioned coffee shop, with a counter in the middle and booths extending off to the sides. Finch was carrying on about the South Bay restaurant scene. You've got here, then you've got Big Walk, and if you like Italian, the pizza place in Hermosa with the signed movie photos. The guy's from Brooklyn, so it's decent. What's Big Walk? Holly said. Ah, tremendous. All you can eat Mongolian. You know, you fill up the bowl with the raw meat and vegetables and hand it to the chef in that circular pit, and he goes to town. So just the three restaurants then? You've obviously whittled it down. I'm on a budget, Finch said, but okay, enough of that. You're a good sport putting up with me. That's not why we came. He told her about the man and woman and the confrontation from the other night. So now you can dig and maybe scoop the L.A. Times, even the cops who want to be the ones asking the questions, he said. Holly was taking notes. Indeed, she said. You never know. Thank you. Something else. They mentioned another person's name, Roland, a couple times. Also, as I think about it, there was a Jaguar parked in front of that room, which didn't mean anything at the time, but was probably their car. And the car wasn't there when the cops talked to me. Maybe they towed it. Unlikely it would happen that quick, and wouldn't you need a warrant for something like that? I'm not sure, but you're saying their car may have been somewhere else when he assaulted her. Now that's quite interesting. Total speculation, of course, Finch said. I used to try to write novels, so admittedly I'm always looking for that edge, real or not. Holly narrowed her eyes slightly and took a moment. Wait a second, she said. Terence Finch? He'd introduced himself, as he always did, as Terry. Uh-oh, he said. Yeah, why? Well, I know your name. That's amazing. I'm ashamed to say I haven't read anything by you. I'm trying to write a novel myself. It's my dream, actually. Good, Finch said, so go for it. I was a creative writing major at Cal State Fullerton, she said. I tried to get into some MFA programs, but I got rejected. My work didn't cut it. Fuck that shit, he said. Sorry, but what you do, you sit your rear end down and you let it all hang out. Those MFAs are a business. I'm not convinced they make you a better writer. In fact, they probably make you worse. Well, I appreciate that, she said, and I guess it's what I need to hear. Do you still write? Me? Nah, that's a young person's game. Really? Let's not focus on me here. What's your thing about? Well, essentially there's a woman who's walking cross-country to raise money for charity. She has adventures along the way, which include a few scares. I know it's trite to say she finds herself, and there's more to it, but that's sort of it. That sounds wonderful, Finch said. I'd love to read what you have. Oh my God, that would be incredible, Holly said. Needless to say, I didn't expect this development tonight. He was writing down his email address. Lucky thing, he said, I remember it. Been inconsistent in that department. Others, too. You seem just perfect to me, Ollie said. She had an award-winning smile, Finch decided. You're lying, he said, but I'll take it. And I'll absolutely work the lead you gave me on the homicide. Like I say, could be dead ends. Newspaper work in general is good fuel for novelists, though. So what are your books about? 
if you don't mind my asking. The first three, pretty much just a guy. The fourth, I tried to do too much. Well, I'm hooked, Holly said. The next morning, instead of his normal shorts, Finch wore his swim trunks into town for his Starbucks stop and down to the beach. It was a bit crazy, he knew, but there was nothing like the presence of an interested and beautiful young woman to help turn back the clock. He hadn't been in the ocean body surfing in 20 years, at least, but today was a good day. And you know what? Maybe he would write that final novel, settle the thing once and for all. Who cares that there are no more publishers and he's stuck with Amazon? Not as big a step down as it used to be. That's for sure, not even close. He even had the title in his head, A Regular Monty. The guy resolves the issue with his sister, moves back from Winnipeg to Oklahoma City, may or may not kill off the guy that screwed him out of the money, and through it all learns to appreciate the little things. The waves were pretty good sized, and the wind had picked up a bit. There were a half dozen boogie boarders in the water and some surfers on the other side of the pier. Because of La Nina, if you bought into that, the water was supposed to be warmer this year, but the initial shock was brutal, and Finch's heart was racing as he ducked under his first wave. It took a few minutes, but he started getting into it and managed a couple of rides. Small stuff, close to the beach, but still something. He got a little more brave and went out further where the boogie boarders were hanging out, and on his third attempt he caught a real wave. He handled the drop and stayed ahead of the white water and rode it all the way in to where his chest scraped the sand, which is how he always liked to finish it off. The old sensation was back. Finch couldn't quite believe it. He worked his way back out, and a big one was developing, and he could hear the boogie boarders getting excited as they adjusted into position. He knew he had this. He took off just a fraction late. The wave broke on top of him and drove him down, and he was trying to breathe and started swallowing water, and he tried to find the surface, but was being somersaulted around and had no idea what direction was up. Everything started to go black, and he saw his parents, and then he was in the yard of his elementary school at recess, and then on a train in South America that was going backwards in the mountains. An arm, a strong one, locked around his chest and pulled, and he was gasping and coughing but now breathing, and the lifeguard cinched the rescue tube around him and angled him onto his back and brought him in. Sir, are you feeling all right, the lifeguard said. Do you want us to call someone? Finch had watched the beach lifeguards for years, envied them, admired them, was awed by some of the things they did. He never expected he'd be part of the deal, but here you were. I'm good, he said. Really, I'm okay. Okay.